You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Welcome back to Force Perspectives. I am your host, Michael Cohn, and joining me, as always, the foe to my bead, Joe Hogan. Yeah, the other guy. How you doing, Mike? How you feeling? You know what? You know what? It's a holiday Monday. Uh, it's been a it's been a bit of a crazy weekend. Uh, it is officially the week of my birthday. Uh, my mm. birthday is on Friday. Um, oh. We just had the 25th anniversary of the Phantom Menace yesterday. Uh, this is uh, this is my favorite time of year. This is like this week specifically is my favorite time of year. <laughs> it's like Star Wars movies uh, generally come out at this time of year. Many of my favorites did at least um and 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 my birthday is around this time and we usually it's like a long weekend and all of that stuff so um i don't know i'm feeling pretty good i'm feeling pretty good i'm like That's dude good. i'm still riding the high of x-men 97 so <clears throat> you know not, not star wars related but uh but i'm still i'm still on that we'll be talking about that over on uh off the record uh on on patreon but uh i but yeah right now we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about more prequel nonsense. More cause... war stars, baby. Yeah, it's just I don't know. There's just something in the air right now. I I I don't that you know what? It's so funny. I posted like we posted the previous episode uh, last Friday, right? Mm. And uh, I mean, it goes out to Patreon early on on the the Monday slash Tuesday, depending on how quickly I edit the episode. And then it comes out on Friday for everybody else. When it came out on Friday for everybody else, I posted it both on on like I posted it on Twitter. I I almost always retweet them on Twitter, right? But um, I reposted it on Facebook with a with, with a message. I was I was less polite about it on Twitter, which is funny. But on Facebook, I was like, I'm I'm done apologizing for this movie. Like like we talked about the Phantom Menace, right? That was the episode, and I'm just like, I'm done apologizing for this movie. Like I'm done. I finished. Like it's a good movie, and anybody who says otherwise is just being a jerk, mm. right? Like I when you compare it to stuff that's come out in the last five years, particularly like the DCEU garbage that's come out. Um, cause I'm such a huge DC fan. Superman's one of my favorite characters, but like those characters have all been so horribly treated. That world is so awful. I mean, like the flash is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. It's so bad. It's so bad. And not only is it bad, it's also like offensive and to make it worse. It has one of the best scenes with Michael Keaton as Bruce Wayne contained within it. So it's like, there's like this one, one delicious little little morsel and it's literally surrounded by by poop, poop. garbage <laughs> and trash poopies yeah Poopoo garbage um which makes it like that's worse that's worse if there was <laughs> nothing redeemable about it i could just forget about it but it does have this one great scene with michael keaton and it just breaks my heart that it's in there um also i mean i, I um oh i can't remember the actor's name but the 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 woman who plays supergirl also does a great job as Supergirl, but unfortunately in a terrible story in a terrible movie. And then she's uh, exploited by being repeatedly murdered for plot development and character development later in the movie. So um, yeah, like the Phantom Menace is an incredible, like the Phantom Menace deserves a criterion edition, right? Like, (laughs) like, I mean, every star Wars movie deserves a criterion edition. You're not going to say that about a lot of the superhero um, and like genre movies that have come out in the last few years that are just cashing in on franchises. Right. So like, I'm just, I'm at this point personally where I'm like, I'm done. Like I'm finished. I no longer apologize for the prequels. All three of them are great movies. Um, They always have been. It's just, people were comparing them to the original trilogy um, and not actually to the films, but to the, 
nostalgia and the the feeling that they had from those movies i and it's just so funny to me because here we are in 2024 and the revisionist history on it is so strong oh yeah there are so many people so many people out there now that are like i always like these movies (laughs) like it's like no you did not did you no you I have had I have had specific fights with you about these movies, um, but now they're like they're like no they're good they're good and and this is this is the fun thing about it and when I say fun it's in quotation marks and it's uh, I'm being facetious the fun thing about it is that they will say, Puh, man compared to the sequels compared to that crap Disney is putting out. And then they'll, and then they'll talk about how good the prequels are and how George Lucas needs to come back. And I'll just be like, you realize like they don't realize this is the thing. Cause we're talking about, we're talking about like, like normal humans and we're talking about um, uh, casual nerds when I'm saying this stuff, because like they don't realize that they sound like the fandom menace. They don't realize <laughs> that they sound like the worst of the star Wars community <clears throat> when they say this stuff. But, but like it's, it, it it's staggering to me how often I hear that sentiment. Um, but then they'll turn around and go rogue one and Andor are the best things star Wars has ever made. And it's like, so, uh, Oh no. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're do fun. You... I like them, but <clears throat> Yeah, they're 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 both very good things. They're far from the best Star Wars because, mm-hmm. as we have discussed so many times, they are missing many elements of Star Wars and or more than Rogue One. Rogue One, I think, has still has a lot of it, but Rogue One, not to get into that, Rogue One suffers from studio meddling and you know fiddling and whatever. I mm-hmm. think that if you had left Gareth alone to make the movie that he wanted to make it would have been a much stronger addition to star wars but um for me personally because a lot of people love it it's a, it's highly ranked for a lot of people but i've had that conversation with so many people lately of like all oh, my favorite things are are rogue one and andor and then i will say to them like so here's the thing about star wars is that they're kids movies i think maybe you don't like star wars that much and i've had a couple of people get mad at me about it not mad but like they kind of bristle right because they went no i like star wars and it's like but i no, i'm not saying you don't like it i don't think you like it as much as you think you like it um but then i've had a couple of other people go like you know what you're right (laughs) like you're right i don't like star wars as much as you like star wars all caps like like the whole thing it's like i like parts of star wars and it's like that's cool that's totally fine like let's all get to a point where we accept that but but uh, circling back around to the prequels it's like give it give it another 15 20 years and all of a sudden the, the you know whatever they're putting out at that point whatever um hologram vr uh you know jacked into our brain star wars they're releasing everybody will be like man there's nothing compared to the sequels. Those movies were so good. <laughs> I, so I just, I, I love it. I love that we're, we are in the era now where we can talk about the prequels and, um and not have to do all of the like equivocating and like, yeah, I know they're not the best movies, but blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, no, let's just talk about them. They're just awesome. Like they're just fun. They're great. And I, uh, In that vein, we're going to continue talking about the prequels today by talking about our favorite prequel characters. Uh, (laughs) Joe, you want to tell tell them how we came to our came to our consensus on this. So we we were concerned that there was going to be a a lot of overlap uh, because Mike and I share a lot of the same views on a lot of these characters and obviously these films. So we're just like. All right, well, let's let's actually tell each other like what our list is, and they were so similar. It was just going to be a lot of, yeah. Yep. So we said, all right, why don't yeah. we do this? Why don't we make one list, <laughs> make it five characters instead of three. We'll throw an honorable mention on there, and then we'll just go from there and talk about why we like these characters instead of just <laughs> like trying to surprise the other one with the exact same character in the exact same spot. Yeah, it was it was pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like, listen, guys, you know, who's at number one, like, yeah. just, just, just <laughs> yeah. cool your jets, like, hold your, hold your horses. Uh, I, we'll, we'll get there. Um, the other caveat that we gave ourselves was uh, not 
we're not including Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're talking about the movies. When we say prequels, we don't mean prequel era. We mean the the prequels, three the films. three movies. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll do Clone Wars at some point. It is its own episode. Yeah. And I think you guys listening, you totally understand where we're coming from with that. Um, we don't need to explain ourselves. So we limited ourselves to film characters. Um and uh yeah so so like this 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 is the list that we came up with and, and i don't know i think this is a pretty good list um there is one thing that i am going to note before we get into it uh all of these characters are male coded characters i i i just want to recognize that that's where <laughs> we're at and i want to make a statement about it which is that this is one of the biggest failings of the prequels is that there really aren't yeah. any strong female characters in the prequels padme is there but i think that like the way that she's treated in revenge of the sith um as as like quite literally a plot point and a vessel for the twins uh is it, like it it like counts her out of this um so like i'll just mention that like there are great background characters <laughs> yeah they're in, awesome. in the prequels that are that are that are female characters um but none of them none of them are are you know enough to 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 make this list for for the two of us but um but yeah it is a failing of that and it is one of the places where i think when we talk about clone wars it comes in and it, it course corrects that Absolutely. very heavily 100%. um so we'll we'll ha i'm i think that i th i wouldn't say it's going to be the opposite but our our prequel or, sorry, our prequel list versus our Clone Wars list will look very different <laughs> distinctly in that way. Because pretty, like I, I, right sure. off the top of my head, you know, like like Ahsoka, yeah. Asajj Ventress, Bo-Katan, yep. like yep. Yep. I can just start rattling off characters that we would talk about in a Clone Wars conversation. And most of the awesome ones are actually women. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I just want to recognize that so that we don't sound like a couple of, you know, cishet white men talking about star wars on the internet and going like the only cool characters in star wars are the dudes that's not the case it's just that the prequels the kind of dudes <laughs> yeah yeah the prequels kind of kind of <laughs> kind of whiffed it on that specific element of <clears throat> star wars um uh, so let's just recognize that and then get on with our conversation um honorable mention right here at the top we're, we're just gonna give it to jar jar binks I, I jar jar is a great character um you know he serves his purpose he does what he does uh but but honestly he's really only in the first movie mm. um he's just kind of he's a he's very much a supporting character in in two and three um and obviously integral in the plot of the third film but i and but second. not um i in the third film what which one's the one? uh no oh yeah i guess it's the second right okay, yeah, yeah never mind it's the second yeah where he when he gives the chancellor emergency powers yeah. you're right um people yeah, were mad about that film. i really loved it i thought that was such a great idea i was like wow it makes sense that jar jar would fall for that like very obvious like oh if only senator Amidala were here mm, yeah. that'd be cool like oh okay <laughs> i'll do it i love i love that it's like that they that we don't even need the scene before that when Palpatine and, and Masameda are like, okay, so Jar Jar is about to come in and here's what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then that happens. And then Jar Jar leaves. And then Masameda turns to Palpatine with a big smile on his face. Like, yeah, we did it. And Palpatine's like, that was your best. Like that was, like that was the most sly you could do that. Like, like, are you kidding? Like, I know it's Jar Jar. I know we did. There were other people in the room, dude. Like, there were other people in the room. I know that's all you needed to do for him, but like for other people, like, come on, man. Like, you could have, you could have acted that a little. It's a little obvious. It was a little on the nose. Um, no, but I love it. I mean, like, like that's one of those places where I will say. And Jar Jar in particular is one of the places where I will remind everybody mm. these are kids' movies. These are mm. movies for kids. They are kids' movies that we also happen to enjoy. Um, and there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of deep stuff within Star Wars. Obviously, there's way more under the surface, um, and and that's the genius of it, and that it grows with us as as we get older and we discover new things and and uh, new new kernels of wisdom to to pull out of it, but um 
but at the heart they are kids movies so stuff like that scenes like that are on the nose because that's it's like the prequels are like are like baby's first political thriller (laughs) you know um and so yeah like it's like it's right there but the other part of it that i will say is that like you guys still haven't learned the lesson like they like 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 so many people have still completely missed what george lucas was getting at with you know democracy and politics and bureaucracy Mm -hmm. and all of that you know um i because there's a lot of people out there who claim to be star wars fans that that profess some things that are uh you know they're more palpatine than they are any other character in star wars um so yeah, like the like Jar Jar is a character for me that like he he fulfills that purpose. He fulfills that role um, of of being, you know, sort of a conduit for the youngest kids in the audience. Mm. <clears throat> when we took the girls to see Phantom Menace the other week, they thought he was hilarious. They loved it. Well, they were in. Right? He's for them. Yeah, exactly. That's all exactly. he's there. And uh, and and. And you know, like like the character goes on to to have some great moments in other pieces of media as well. So, um, you know, like like he he's 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 more than just his appearance in the Phantom Menace. Um, and I think sometimes in discourse, people kind of overlook that. I not kind of they do because most of the people who are going to have that discourse with you aren't even aware of the other media that he's in, right? Mm. Um. Yeah, so that's he's one of those characters. I I love him. I love Jar Jar. I love Jar Jar with every fiber of my being. Also, and, uh, like, not to mention just how like revolutionary that was for the technology of the time. Like, yeah, I know we've probably beaten that to death, but like modern big budget filmmaking, like a lot of this started with Jar Jar. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, and and it's easy to go to like, oh well, it's like it's Jar Jar, and then and then we go to Gollum, and then you know, like the and talk about fully digital characters um, that are like one hundred percent digital on screen. Which, by the way, Jar Jar technically is not, but that's a whole other thing. Um, there are many many shots in the film where he is where they're only doing like a head replacement, or mm. um, because his head is out of the shot. And we're just seeing an arm, uh, and Ahmed Best was done up in full makeup. Um, like there, there are there are multiple shots that I could point out in a watch along where I'm like, that's not a CG shot. That is, it looks so good because that's literally mm. Ahmed in in makeup, right, in body paint. Um, but when we talk about superhero movies, I and you talk about a character like Iron Man, you talk about Spider Man, you talk about really like all of them, every single one of them, um, we would not have the fully digital, you know, stunt doubles that we get in those movies looking as good as they do to the point where most of you watching those films are not questioning the fact that that's not a physical character, Mm. right? Um, That starts with Jar Jar. That starts with Jar Jar and George pushing the envelope here. Um, So yeah, absolutely. You're right. I mean, like he is, he is, an integral foundational piece of film history, uh, whether people want to accept that or not, it's the <laughs> truth. So, um, yeah, Jar Jar, our honorable mention. Um, you want You want to, you have anything else to say about Jar Jar? You want to jump into number five? Yeah, let's do five. So number five, we got to have at least one glup in this, in this conversation, um, <laughs> because it is the prequels and the prequels are real. I mean, like, listen, there are all sorts of glups in, in the original trilogy. Obviously <clears throat> it's a star Wars thing and the cantina is just a room full of them, but I feel like the prequels are really where this aspect of star Wars sh- shown the brightest and this character to me actually like exemplifies that idea because he started as as a glup and became one of the most uh, explored characters of this era. And that's Kit Fisto. Um, <laughs> my guy rolled onto the scene in Attack of the Clones with a winning smile and uh, some, you know, I, I, the tentacle dreadlocks. And, uh, and, and won all of our hearts instantly. And, uh, yeah, I, I, as a result, 
he goes on to be one of the most explored characters of the prequel era through the comics and clone wars and novels and all of that stuff but at the same time like manages to to leave an indelible mark on the films i think like he like kit to me really exemplifies that final act of attack of the clones right Mm. um with the jedi arriving and all of that it's like him and mace i think like you put them side by side which we do then in revenge of the sith see them side by side right um like that's really like that's the that's the vibe like those guys are the vibe this party is over and then we're gonna we're gonna rescue anakin obi-wan and padme right um but yeah he just it's the look it's the vibe it's all of it i don't know there's just something so perfect about kit fisto what's it what is your relationship to kit fisto joe um i mean i've always been you know kind of a big fan of him even though there wasn't like that much from the film but like you know obviously the micro series is something that yeah was huge for me becoming an artist in the first place so like he has his little vignette in that um he's in star wars tales and he gets to like help Ayla Sakura breathe underwater in that one. So really they're just making out underwater and it's just like, mm-hmm. they have this like flirty weird Jedi thing. Um, so like, I've always, I've always really loved that they, you know, had that extra material for him, even though he just wasn't like super, I mean, that's Star Wars, right? Like every character has their backstory stuff that like you can explore everything outside of the film. But for me, Kit, when I think of Kit Fisto, the thing that I think about most is how, you know, on the other hand, Phantom Menace, the Jedi Council were there, and like, okay, yeah, all these cool aliens or whatever. But, like, I don't know what it is, but the look of the Jedi in Attack of the Clones is so different from Phantom Menace, and I just like them a lot more. Like, I when I think of, yeah. like, yeah, my cool alien Jedi, I think of, immediately, I go to Attack of the Clones, and I'm thinking of, like, just like all of the shots of Kit Fisto, Luminara, Barris, you know, Shakti is in there, Coleman Trevor, Trevor is in there, like all the really cool new Jedi together. And then like, obviously they're all in the arena together. And like they, the Jedi that are new go really well with the Jedi that are from like the last one. So like those Jedi with Mace with um with Plo Koon, with you know what I mean? With Kiati Mundi, like all of these guys are like, Yeah, these are my guy. It's like all of these guys look awesome together. They I like I love the arena fight scene. Um but yeah, Kid Fisto is just like for me, kind of the uh, almost the mascot, right? Of of like yeah. yeah, the Attack of the Clones Jedi. It's Kid Fisto is the first one I think of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like that. I, I, you, you took the words out of my mouth. I was literally gonna say he is like he is emblematic, iconic. Mm-hmm. He is the mascot of that era of Jedi, um, going into that period of time between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. I'm talking about not like the the period in the in in the canon in the mm-hmm. story, but in like our lives, right? Um, Kit Fisto was this character that was like front and center um i like uh, i mean i really like it when we pair up kit fisto and plo Koon. like that yeah. happens a lot as yeah. well yeah. um <clears throat> but this is the thing is that <clears throat> you've got cestus deception which is one of my favorite clone wars novels which pairs kit fisto with obi-wan um so there's a pairing right you've got you've got the comics that did kit fisto and plo Koon. Um, you've got other comics that did Kit Fisto and Ayla Sakura. So a lot of it, like there was just so much of that era that was like, Hey, we're going to do a, we're going to do a clone wars, um, uh, you know, interstitial storytelling piece. Um, who are we going to use? Well, I really like this guy. Cool, cool, cool. Throw him with Kit Fisto and make a thing. Um, so Kit just became like, that's, he just became that dude, right? Like he, he was, he was absolutely ever present from the the finale of of attack of the clones all the way through until revenge of the sith Mm -hmm. right um until he he goes down like a punk but the other part of it is that you know i who who do we show up with to to arrest palpatine it's mace it's kit it's sicy no it's not sicy 10 is it yeah yeah sicy 10 and agent kalar 
and Agent Carter. By, and, by and, the way, those four guys also have like a two-parter comic in Star Wars Republic where they stop a prison riot or something like that. And yeah, they're just yeah. like awesome together. So like you're supposed to read that and then in the movie like, oh man, these guys are together again. They're going to go kick some, even though like we know they're not going to go kick some butt. Um, but it's supposed yeah. to be like, oh man, these guys are really good together. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, but Sicey Tin and Agent Kolar go down like a couple of punks. Like they yeah. don't even get they don't even get a block in, right? Like they just die. Like they're just like Palpatine has a lightsaber. What's happening? And it's like, do, did Mace not brief you guys? Mm. Sith Lord, expect a lightsaber, dudes. Um, but at least Kit Fisto gets a couple of blocks in and at least one strike before he goes down. Um, and I, I, I love the. There's there are many many memes where it's like I I the other two are obviously dead and Mace Windu goes on to fight Palpatine but Kit Fisto is just like playing dead so he's like out there in the galaxy somewhere he's just like play dead just like be cool like just don't don't let don't let him know you're still alive um <clears throat> yeah but I I I I make that joke all the time it's like well clearly he's one of the best Jedi cuz like he lasted longer than yeah. these other two <laughs> in this fight um but yeah, I I love Kit Fisto. He he just from that first moment on screen, um, I I can remember seeing Attack of the Clones and like walking out of the theater and loving so much about it, and obviously being super high off of the the Yoda stuff, right? Mm -hmm. oh, At man. the very end of the movie, um, but loving so much of it and like that because because Attack of the Clones is the movie that they. It wasn't instantaneous, but it did, it did have a pretty immediate effect with me, like in cementing Obi Wan as one of my favorite characters. But like, I came out of that movie just like that that and we didn't know his name, right? Like, it, I was just like that green dude at the end. Like, that was that was so great. He was so awesome. That smile, like, and he's got the like because it's part of that moment with C three PO. So he's interacting with a classic character, um, which I think goes a long way to to us you know, being endeared to him. Um, but yeah, we're in the middle of this very like, I am tense moment. It's a star Wars movie. How tense does it really get? Yeah. But, um, but, but, you know, he's kind of, it, it, you know what it is? It, it's the little guy thing. It's the yeah. little guy. It's my whole it's, little it's guy theory, right? He, yeah. He comes in and he is fun. He is approachable. He, he has just a great moment with the audience. Um, where where we're sort of like made to feel ah, everything's gonna be all right <laughs> we're gonna be fine everything's gonna be fine i know that this is like this is kind of one of our like it's gonna we're gonna end on like a darker middle chapter moment here with like anakin's had his hand chopped off and you know dooku gets away and and like you know did we really win you know begun the clone wars have and all of that stuff but like we had a lot of fun we had a lot of fun here guys um in the midst of you know Django Fett being decapitated and all of that, it's like eh, it's a good time. This is a lot of fun, and Kit Fisto just yeah he 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 rocks that moment. Um, so yeah, I love him, and and obviously like he goes on to get so much character development and so many great moments in, in the Clone Wars, mm -hmm. the micro series, the comics, um, all of that stuff. It the one thing that I have to say about Kit Fisto that I am disappointed about. And I, for the prequel era in general, we never got a Jedi Power Battles 2. Uh, and if we had, yeah. you know Kit Fisto would have been one yeah. of those playable characters. You know he would have been one of those playable characters. Um, yeah. I'm actually not a fan of that game. I really oh, want no? to be. It's just, I don't know what it was. Just like the platforming stuff <clears throat> was so like I, I could never get past any of the platforming stuff. I was always falling off yeah. cliff because I just felt like the... The controls for that were just not tight. Um, oh, Jedi Power Battles is an awful, awful video game. Yeah. Like, let's let's make that abundantly clear. It's not a well-made video game. Um, but is it one of the best video games? Like, uh, like <laughs> Phantom Menace tie-ins? Absolutely. It made me it's not feel good, but I hated best, playing it, one. if that makes yeah. sense. It's so funny because the best, the best, the best prequel video games. This is a whole episode we'll we'll do at some point, I'm sure. But the best prequel era video games are um, 
episode one racer is number one yeah. <laughs> like I, there's no debate like episode one racer is the best it holds up to this day i can grab that play it right now it's as good as any modern game that i'm playing um if they do if they made another one all i want is better graphics don't change the controls like what they did with the re-release the 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 one that came out on switch and uh, i mean I, I, maybe it came out on everything but i played it on switch perfect they they updated the controls just slightly perfect don't change it like it's perfect it's a perfect video game just make a new one where i can make a custom pod racer and give me like 20 more tracks 20 more pod racers and you know a story mode but whatever um i i the other one is episode three on the uh on the on the ds i it's like a side scrolling uh beat em up game and it's very it's it has a lot of what jedi power battles has in it but it's sprite based it's like it's like old school like uh uh you know like maximum carnage sort of like like those spider-man like x-men capcom um uh arcade game style thing but it's got all these like combos and stuff like that it's so good so good hmm. uh but uh yeah like i said that's a whole other episode but <laughs> but but jedi power battles whole it has its place it has its place in that era um and uh yeah episode one was really funny for the video game releases but um that's my one complaint kit fist we never got a kit fisto jedi power battles installment um but it's not too late it's never too late let's make jedi power battles 2 now and i i it's it's kit fisto and uh who else would would you throw in there i guess coleman trevor and uh, i mean i would go <laughs> luminar or shock t or somebody <clears throat> yeah for sure ala <clears throat> secure i guess has to be in there right oh, We're talking yeah about okay episode sure. two episode two introduced characters right um yeah <clears throat> cool well let's let's jump into number four uh a character that has actually been mentioned a couple of times at this point already <laughs> i i that's palpatine uh go go for papa palpatine i uh, the that's anytime somebody says palpatine <laughs> that that robot uh, chicken robot chicken sketch just pops into my head <laughs> immediately instantly um palpatine listen controversial he's not number one on our list but i would say in terms of like the best written character in the prequels I th- I think it's Palpatine. Yeah, I think it's I Palpatine. Think that's pretty fair. It's at least debatable, and I don't mean that, yeah. like you can argue. I mean, you could argue against it, I guess. But like, I I I think he, he's who is who would be written better. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's Anakin. No, <clears throat> the the whole the whole trilogy hinges on that character Mm. both the way that he's written as well as as the performance from ian mcdermott um and here's this guy that had shown up in the final film of the original trilogy i all decked out in makeup really doesn't have that much to do um, he just kind of shows up and smiles at Vader as they walk past all the stormtroopers, and uh, and then and then you know obviously you know in the third act we we get a lot of Palpatine, but didn't even have a name. He was just the Emperor at the time, and uh, yeah, I mean like 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 people are were fascinated with him. Do we get the Dark Empire stuff? um that that expands on palpatine as a character but then we go back to the prequels and i can remember people like debating me that palpatine senator palpatine who becomes chancellor palpatine supreme chancellor i was not actually sidious that they were two different characters this is like when phantom menace was out there were there were people that were like fighting with me and i'm like it's the same actor it's the same dude like that's the like that's the story you guys like he is he is the emperor in return of the jedi it's the same actor and people would be like no man no it's a fake out it's a fake out it's palpatine and sidious are two different guys and i would just be like what are you ta- like what are you are you high like what are you talking about I, um i remember I so, so many people so 
doing like uh, saying that same thing. Like I don't, I don't know. Like even though his name is Palpatine, it's like really his name is Palpatine. Yeah, he's literally uh, like his lower face in a hood. Like, what is what's the uh, disconnect yeah. here? I'm sorry, but those the <laughs> those those teeth, lips, and nose are iconic (laughs) they are iconic um because because like the reason why he's framed that way in phantom menace and whenever we see sidious up until revenge of the sith right is because like that's what was iconic about him in return of the jedi is that like his eyes were barely visible um and it was really like we were getting so much just from that mouth Mm -hmm. right um but yeah, but then you look at, at at Senator Palpatine and it's like, that's the same dude, you guys. It's the same dude. Um, but I, I get it. I mean, people people were were looking for that Luke, I am your father twist to mm-hmm. happen in the prequels. And it never does. Right. Like that never comes. Um, we get a little bit of one when Dooku reveals that he was Qui-Gon's master right Mm -hmm. like there's a little tiny bit of that element but not really um but yeah i i but ian mcdermott just like crushes throughout these three movies i mean like like when i say at the beginning of this episode that like the prequels are very good films Mm -hmm. one of the things that i am talking about when i'm saying that one of the things that defines that for me (laughs) is palpatine as a character Mm -hmm. like like his performance the way he's written and his performance are one of those things where i'm like this is better than the villain in 90 percent of the mcu (laughs) films right um and i love a lot of those bad guys i love a lot i i love many of those movies as much as i love the prequels but I love the MCU because the heroes are so great. The villains, although we have some really, really great villains within the MCU, <clears throat> most of them are just kind of there, right? Like most of them are kind of just like the mirror, the dark shadow reflection of the hero. Um, but Palpatine as a villain, I mean, like I, I would say that you don't get better in film like there's just uh, in in media like like there are other villains who are as good as palpatine but i don't think that you do better like i think like this dude he's so evil he's so powerful he's so villainous that he even managed to come back in rise of skywalker And in a very meta way, not only be the bad guy for that film, but just for like that entire trilogy, Um, like in the real world, he is he like he became emblematic of of the the, the real world villainy of uh, of the sequel trilogy. Um, And like just he just he, he just comes he he comes back and he just ruins it for all of us. And it's not like that is not Ian McDiarmid's fault. It's not even the character's fault. It's uh uh, Chris Terrio but um but yeah like Palpatine is just like he he's he is he's so good that they that they didn't have any choice but to bring him into Rise of Skywalker right like they felt like they had to do that because Palpatine became so synonymous with the dark side so if they were going to like close the loop on the Skywalker saga and and you know and on Rey um finally quote unquote defeating the dark side which we know that that's nonsense and they sh- it was a fool's errand to try and do it to begin with but they thought that that's what they were going to do and it's like how are we going to do that well we got to bring back palpatine um yeah like everything is compared to it snoke is compared to it right like it's it, i i all of star wars is just like yeah but are you going to have a bad guy as good as palpatine right um so that to me like that that that's why he's on this list over Dooku or Maul or Grievous um, as, you know, I, I felt kind of felt like we had to have one bad guy, right? Because mm. um, it's easy for us to just name a list of cool Jedi <laughs> and be done with it. Right. But but you got you to gotta have one of the bad guys in there. And as much as I love Maul now, um, certainly like throughout the prequel era, uh, when the movies were being released, like Maul 
post Phantom Menace release just became like less and less cool uh, as time went on for me until he was reintroduced in the Clone Wars. So again, a character that we will re- revisit when we have a Clone Wars conversation, but um, and certainly like Maul to me is one of the best villains in Star Wars. But um, uh, and and as I've said before on on podcasts, like he's my favorite bad guy in Star Wars. But um, but Palpatine is like Palpatine's the top. He's the cream of the crop, guys. Like like there's really no denying it. Because um, he's not just a villain for the prequel characters, right? Like he's also like Ezra goes up against him, right? Like it, I, I, he just, he crops up. He, the force unleashed. He's a bad guy that we're going <laughs> to deal with, you know, like, like he just, he's, he is ever present. He's ever present. Um, and just so, so brilliantly performed by Ian McDermott, um, that everybody else who comes along to, to do it is, is measured against that yardstick. It's so iconic. Right. Um, I don't know, anything else to say about Palpatine before we move on? Uh, I I have just always loved how, especially in Revenge of the Sith, I think more than any other film, how we finally see Palpatine just like eating up every second about being evil. Like he loves mm. being, like when he <laughs> shoots Yoda with lightning, he is living his best life and he's like here we go baby i waited so long for this this is awesome that was i mean everything ian mcdermott did like okay maybe not everything the the poor man with the lightsaber duel that was kind of sprung on him at the last minute like okay there was there were some shots with that but like other than that the actual like performance of the character um so good but i think that was really that has always been my favorite character moment because it's just like oh this guy's such a jerk and he loves being a jerk. And like, yeah. I don't know what it is. It's just, it's just like, it's, it's, it's still a very endearing thing to me that I just, it's fun to see villains loving being villains. Yeah. The, one of the great things about it for me is that, and this is like sort of the meta things is that Ian himself <clears throat> is such a delightful he's person. He's so nice. Like he said, you can just tell, like, he's just a nice guy. Um, have you, have I, you ever like, met very, him? I I'm trying to think. I don't think that I have. I don't think I don't think that I've met him like face to face, but I I have been in his presence um at Star Wars Celebration mm. on, on more than one occasion. Uh but uh, I I have but a yeah, quick I don't... little Ian McDermott and Anthony yeah, Daniels story. Yeah, get, go for it. it. Um yeah. so it was the very last day of celebration six in Orlando. Um and that's usually the day that uh everybody just kind of like goes back to the hotel, packs up because everybody's flying out on, you know, Monday morning or Sunday night or whatever. Um, we were staying at the Peabody Hotel, which was the hotel that was directly across. The street. I think they changed the name of it since then. Uh, but it's the hotel that's directly across the street where most of the time, a lot of the celebrities stay. So mm-hmm. we saw a lot of people while we were um, there over the course of the week. Um, but a bunch of us decided, OK, well, we're going to stay. Uh, an extra day we're gonna just have a chill day on monday we'll fly out on tuesday so instead of going and saying goodbye to everybody the bunch of us just kind of went to the bar just to chill out after celebration and um nobody in the bar literally we're the only table in there and then on the other side of the the entire other side of the bar we see anthony daniels and ian mcdermott uh, uh, sit down at a table by themselves and we're like okay we're not gonna be those guys we're not gonna go over and bug them let them do their thing. We'll be over here. And, but I was like, all right, well, I have an idea. When the waitress came over to, to uh, you know, take our order, see if anybody wanted another round. I said, uh, you know, we don't want to bother the two gentlemen over there, but just, can you let them know that we would like to buy them a round? So she goes over, eventually she comes back and, and she said, Oh, uh, they said, thank you very much, but they're, they're, not going to be staying, but they they appreciated the offer. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. That's pretty neat that I got to do that. Maybe 10 minutes later, the two of them come over to us to chit chat and just like thank us for for the offer. And so we just got to like, you know, shoot the breeze with them for about, you know, five or 10 minutes until they left. And I was just like, that was super classy of them. They didn't have to do that. Like, mm. but I, I guess they realized like, okay, they they, you know, wanted to make a nice gesture, but like, also respected 
you know, our privacy and everything. And like, that was it. So like, I, I just thought that was really cool that they came over just to chit chat a little bit. And he was yeah, very funny. Awesome. He was very funny. Uh, yeah. It, it, he's uh, every time that I've seen him like a, a appear on stage or whatever. Uh, it's always, you just get the, I don't know. He just gives off a vibe and maybe it's mm. just charisma. Right. But, but, uh, and it's just that actor thing, but but yeah, he just he he seems like such a wonderful guy. But then he plays absolutely like the most despicable, right. gross, bad guy you can imagine, right? Um, uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, so that was our number four, Palpatine. I will flip from him to like the inverse of this character uh, with number three, which is Yoda. For us, um, Yoda in the prequels. You, you this this was one that you brought more than me. So I'll, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to you. T- okay, talk about cool. Yoda. Uh, I mean, I've always been, like, a big Yoda fan in general. Like, I was always OT Yoda, like, hardcore. Size ma- I'm a short guy. I'm a little guy. Size matters not. Like, all of that stuff growing up for me meant a lot. So, like, you know, trying your best. Uh, you know, I don't believe it. That's why you fail. All of those things in eight-year-old baby Joe Hogan, like, resonated, like, unspeakably so i was already a yoda guy going into the prequels and i understand that yoda in the in the prequels is not the same character that we see in the original trilogy and you know he kind of is a really a big part of the problem of the jedi order obviously he's the head of it um despite Mm -hmm. the fact that he knows that you know too sure of themselves right even the older more experienced ones even though that includes yoda you know i still loved the um hard to put it's hard to put my finger on it um but something that really kind of solidified it for me and i know for a lot of people it was kind of the op- had the opposite effect um attack of the clones was my first midnight show i had ever gone to so you know i was in a completely sold out packed theater first time you know like i said seeing a midnight movie and that scene at the end, he shows that you see the little shadow slowly getting bigger, walking into the Geonosis hangar. And everybody's like, oh, and just the, the, the chaos that, in, that ensued after he just pulls his, his, you know, cloak to the side. You see the lights over there. I heard, couldn't hear anything over the roar mm-hmm. of the crowd consistently for that entire lightsaber battle. You couldn't hear any sound effects over just like just the noise, the storm of screaming, uh, you know, nerdy men. Um, that moment was so awesome because it was like, yeah, size matters not. Here's why Yoda is the master. It was so like, I wasn't expecting it. Even though I had the toy that had a lightsaber. I forgot that the toy came with a lightsaber. Um <laughs> I just wasn't ready for that moment. And it was just like the the smile did not come off my even when I was home falling asleep, I was still smiling, thinking about Yoda demolishing Dooku with in a lightsaber fight and Dooku had to cheat to get away. Um Yeah, I don't know, man. Yoda Yoda has always just been the embodiment of like, yeah, don't count this don't count this guy out just because he's small and green and he talks funny. Yeah, absolutely. I, I obviously Yoda is an original trilogy character and and iconic for uh, uh, you know the all of the 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 Yoda isms from Empire and even even in Jedi. Um, but he's such a central character to the prequels that it's kind of hard not to include him include him on the list. I I and and those great moments I uh, in in attack of the clones and, and revenge of the Sith, <clears throat> those duels, uh, like you, you can't, you can't deny it. Like I, people, people will try and use that as one of those things where they're like, Oh yeah. But like, it doesn't, it like kind of jump the shark a bit. And it's like, I don't know. Does it, does it? Because I'm pretty sure from like episode one forward, like, at, like and, um, until we got the moment in attack of the clones, and even before that in, you know, in fandom and whatnot, like, have you not all been asking for this? Have you not all been demanding this <laughs> for 
eons, you know, like, like, yeah, but like, what did Yoda fight with a lightsaber? Right. Um, and there's an argument to be made that, that it actually somewhat diminishes the character, um, because he was just, you know, sort of the sage wisdom previously, and then you give him a lightsaber and now all of a sudden, you know, he's just like every other Jedi. But to me, that's kind of actually the point. Yeah. That is kind of the point yeah. is that I think one of the things that George wanted to get across with, uh, with Yoda in, a, in, in attack of the clones and revenge of the Sith is that Yoda is not above the other Jedi. Mm-hmm. That's kind of one of the problems is that there is a perspective. I go back to the conversation that Obi-Wan and Anakin have in the speeder um, talking about skills with a lightsaber, which is obviously like foreshadowing that Yoda Mm. will use his lightsaber in this movie. Right. But there's like sort of their back and forth. And it it is the precursor to the comments that that Yoda makes later in the movie, where he's like, you know, uh, you know, too, so sort of too arrogant, too proud of themselves, too too sure of themselves, you know, like these Jedi are even even the older ones, right? Where it's like they're Anakin and Obi Wan are having this debate about like, well, you know, if you practiced your saber technique as much as your wit, you'd rival Master Yoda. I thought I already do, and it's like like they're they're doing what we did as fans. And I think it's George making a commentary on it. Like I've always felt this way. It's like, cause they're talking about power rankings. Yeah. Right. And Yoda in empire would never Yoda in the last Jedi would laugh at Yoda in, Je- in, in empire strikes back with how close Yoda in empire strikes back was to that way of thinking mm. before he became one with the force. Right. Cause Yoda in the last Jedi, it has been one with the force for now like decades and, and like knows all sees all understands everything. Right. And so he just laughs at all of it. Cause it's all just a cosmic joke. Right. But the Yoda from empire would look back at the Yoda does look back at the Yoda in the prequels and, and thinks of, of, of the failure there. Right. Um, And so like all of that stuff that we see that this is, this is one of the great things. And I think, honestly, I think in 20 years when people look at Luke in the last Jedi and there's been subsequent storytelling and all of that. And, and, you know, we fill in the gaps that people need filled in in order for that character to make sense to them. Um, I think that people will feel very similar to Luke, uh, similar about Luke to the way that they, that we feel about Yoda. Now mm. Yoda in the prequels is not meant to be seen as perfect or heroic. He is a failure. He is, a flawed character. Um, so when he pulls out his lightsaber to duel, that's like, he's already made the mistake, right? Like, like, and, and he, and empire Yoda knows that because empire Yoda would say to Luke, like, like what's in there. Only what you take with you, leave your weapons. You'll, you won't need them. Like, like, like don't, if you go in with a lightsaber, a lightsaber is what you're going to use. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's why Yoda in the original trilogy has no lightsaber. He has, he does not fight um, because he knows where that leads. Right. Um, And he's almost like, like at that point, Yoda, people will kind of make the comments of like, well, well, I don't know. Like, why wouldn't Yoda go with Luke? If Yoda could do the things that he did in attack of the clones, why wouldn't he go with Luke to fight Vader? And it, or to you know defeat the emperor and in Star Wars Infinities he does I I um, he doesn't go with Luke he goes with with Leia but um, in the Empire one but I uh, the whole point of that is that like Yoda has become a pacifist like a true pacifist like he's a he's a he's 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 become a Buddha right like he's 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 enlightened and he's like fighting fighting only begets more fighting so the only way not to fight is not to fight <laughs> right? right like so he stays out of it right it's i i um it actually a great star wars movie that's not star wars tron legacy ha- like it i i 
Kevin Flynn like basically says that like he's the only way to 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 not lose is to not play the game right like you just stay out of it um but by doing that you also are allowing the bad guys to win so it's like the catch-22 of that right and that's sort of like that's the predicament that characters like Yoda find themselves in but the exploration of that in in the prequels to me is is core to the prequels like it's like it's integral Yoda has to fight with a lightsaber because he has like these characters are destined for failure in the prequels I think that's one of the things that has taken two decades for people to come to terms with about those movies is that like there is no happy ending all three of them are Empire Strikes Back Right. Like all three of them are going to leave you with that dissatisfied feeling. You're never going to get your return of the Jedi moment in the prequels, even though like we fake one at the end of the Phantom Menace. That actually has become one of my favorite scenes in the entire prequel trilogy, because once you realize that the music that's playing over that is is the Emperor's theme. (laughs) <laughs> but in like an upbeat, happy yeah. version with these children singing it. Like major but it is whatever, like, yeah. yeah, but it's, but it is Palpatine's theme and it's playing over this entire scene. And we've got all of the Jedi there and Padme gives this look to Anakin and Obi-Wan looks down like, and everybody's like, like, you know what? I think we're going to be all right. And then like they hold up the orb or whatever. And it's like, you know, peace. And all. it's like, no guys, this is just the start. Palpatine is right where he wants to be this is how it all goes wrong Mm -hmm. right here right now and you're all celebrating but what you're celebrating is the end of the republic in the beginning of the empire right and i just i love that i think that's so great and yoda yoda and mace have that scene right before that in qui-gon's funeral where they're talking not in a whisper at all for everybody to hear (laughs) Just like two feet. It's okay. We're two feet away from everybody. Um, but yeah, but it's silent right now, dudes. I, uh, you know, where they're talking about, about, about Palpatine, who is across the fire from them. I, uh, you know, who was destroyed the master, of the apprentice. And it's just, I like, yeah, Yoda, Yoda. I feel like, I mean, I said it, you know, like we, we flip it. We go from Palpatine to Yoda. He's the inverse of it. Yoda's characterization across the the prequel trilogy is so important to the overall story. Um, But it is something that required a lot of processing. It required a lot of work for the fans to do after the fact in order to see just how well it was done by George Um, and how, uh, how much of that is intentional and how much of that is us, you know, uh, adding on layers because of other storytelling and, and whatnot after the fact it is debatable. Um, I would say that the stuff that we get in the Clone Wars, especially in the Lost season, right in season six, with his journey into the Force and all of that stuff. I mean, I think that I think that that implies that George was thinking about it the whole time. He j- it just maybe wasn't executed perfectly. Um, but yeah, because uh, like it because in the movies it comes across as. I, I failed. I almost swore there. <laughs> it's like, I failed <laughs> going to exile. I must, right? Like, and he just, he just pieces out. Right. Um, and, and, but, but it's there, but it's there. It, like when you view it in context of, you know, you zoom out to the whole saga, it's absolutely there. Um, that, that Yoda realizes too late there was no way that we were going to win this by playing by his rules, right? Mm. Like, like Palpatine threw the entire galaxy into conflict because that's how the Sith win. And the only way that we would have defeated him was by not engaging was by not giving him exactly what he wanted. Right. But, but what was the alternative? Well, there is no alternative. It's like, so now we're into the debate, right? It's like, well, what were we going to do? Just let the separatists, destroy the republic 
Well, yeah, because the Republic was corrupted by the Sith. So <laughs> yes, yes, let the let let them destroy. And it's like, and that, and now we're talking about you know now we're looking at Barra Sophia and we're like, was she right? Yeah, she was right. Did she turn to the dark side? No, <laughs> she was the only one who saw what was happening. You know, like did she take a bad path to get there? Absolutely. But like, was she correct? Yes. Was Dooku right? Dooku was right. Did Palpatine use the fact that Dooku was right to manipulate him and turn him to the dark side? A thousand percent. <laughs> and so much of this hinges on on the things that Yoda says and the, and that character throughout the the prequel trilogy. That it's like, yeah, and he's Yoda. He's Yoda, guys. How how is he not going to be on this list? He's Yoda. <laughs> like, come on. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. Star Wars is so cool. Did you know that, Joe? That Star uh, Wars is so cool. I had an inkling. I'm still waiting for my Eureka moment, but yeah, you know. Yeah. It's fine. I love this this is this is why this is why despite everything that, you know, podcasting and and Star Wars discourse on the internet does to us psychologically and for our mental health and emotional health. Um Despite all of that, I come back to it and I can't I can't get away from it because we have moments like this on the podcast where I'm just like, man, Star Wars is so great. It's so great. This is this this is what we're here for. Um, Pretty neat. Number two on our list. This is the lead into number one, to be honest. <laughs> number two is Qui-Gon Jinn. I I. I mean, like, I think that this one is is very subjective for the two of us. Sure, uh, you and you and I love this character mm. to such a degree, um, and I think it's. I think a lot of it is by proximity of number one. I, of course, I, yeah. But but also, Qui Gon Qui Gon exists narratively in juxtaposition to Obi Wan and in juxtaposition to Yoda and and the Jedi Council and. Um, and as a precursor to Count Dooku in a lot of ways. And I think like, that's like, that's the strength of the character. I, the, the only bad thing I ever have to say about Qui-Gon Jinn is that we don't get nearly enough of him. Mm. Um, I, but he serves his purpose. He serves his purpose, purpose narratively. And I think George showed a lot of restraint by killing him in the first film because here he sets up this character that is, you know, debatably one of the most perfect Jedi in the saga. Um, he he has already achieved at this point, in the midst of the downfall of the Jedi Order, Qui-Gon has seen and understood what we attribute to Luke later on in the saga, right? Of like throwing down the lightsaber mm -hmm. sort of thing. I, I, and, and, you know, like, like when faced with, with Darth Maul, he, he succumbs to that, that instinct to fight just like all the other Jedi do throughout the Clone Wars. But in the rest of the film, he, he very much exemplifies what it means to be a Jedi. And I, uh, even in the, even in the face of the rest of the order, sort of like laughing at him for it, mm. he still holds true to it. And so much of what I'm talking about right now is actually informed by, by master and apprentice and, uh, and, and, and Dooku uh, Jedi it's Dooku Jedi lost, I think is, is yeah, the full title Jedi of that lost, one. Yeah um as well as you know <laughs> tales of the jedi and all of that like we've gotten all of this subsequent storytelling that has that has added to qui-gon as a character um and as we add to dooku we add to qui-gon because so much of dooku before he left the order is mirrored in in things that qui-gon says that's there's some really really great writing with dooku as a character that um that works so well because those writers really looked at the things that Qui-Gon was saying and they, and they went, okay, so, so Qui-Gon says them, they're right. But if we make them come out of Dooku's mouth, we'll have people question it. Mm. Right. Like people will be like, mm. but then you sit there and you go like, but he's saying the same things that Qui-Gon says. He's just, he's taking them to the, to the extreme. Right. Like he's like, he's, he's, he, we know where this leads. We know that this is going to lead to him turning to the dark side. Um, so those two characters to me, I mean, like, like 
I think we've talked about it before. Jedi lineage to me is one of the most fascinating things in the in the films. Mm-hmm. Um as well as like like the the shows and stuff like that. I mean like I think the the Ahsoka storyline hinges on it, right? Like it requires us to inspect it. I mean it's it it it, it, it doesn't just hinge on it. It's like it's it's vocalized, right? Mm-hmm. Balin says as much. He's like of course you are who you are. Look at who your master was and look at who his master was. And, and before that, right? Like, cause Balin's looking at it and going like, you are the inevitable offspring of Darth Sidious. Like that's like, or not Darth, of Darth Tyrannus, right? Like, mm-hmm. like that's like you, like, like Anakin falling to the dark side is, is because he is fruit of the poisonous tree, the poisonous tree starting with Dooku. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so like Dooku to Qui-Gon, Qui-Gon to Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan to Anakin, Anakin to Ahsoka, right? Like it just like, uh, uh, it's, it's all there. And I love that. I, I, I love looking at that and inspecting that stuff, but it's the, it's the thing that, that Yoda says in the last Jedi where he's like, like, you know, they are what we grow beyond, Right. And the whole aspect of like, like pass on what you've learned, not just the good stuff, also the failure. In fact, like that's more important. And I think that like Qui-Gon is one of those characters who is trying to do that very early on. Like, like the, the line that he has to Obi-Wan after Obi-Wan's like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I know, like I've, I've been a real pain in the butt and I keep questioning you. And I, I, like like i i I should support you when we're in front of the jedi council and stuff like that like he's he's sort of like like he's he's being very um uh uh, apologetic and uh uh, i I can't think of the word right now but um he's just sort of like throwing himself on qui-gon's mercy and qui-gon turns to him and he's like dude a you're doing everything that i ever taught you to do like don't (laughs) don't ever take what i say at face value always question always 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 right question everyone around you trust the living force like these are the two most important things that i can impart to you right and 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 then he's like he's like you are ready i'm not like i wasn't lying to the council just so that i could take anakin as a as a padawan this is all subtext right because it's all it's like two lines that they exchange but this is all there he's like you are ready i believe that and I foresee you'll be a much wiser Jedi than I am. Like you, like you're gonna, you are going to. He says what Yoda tries to teach Luke in the Last Jedi. He already gets it. This is why Qui Gon is such a great character. He is already standing in front of Obi Wan and going like, "That was the point. That's always been the point. You will be a better Jedi than I was." Like, like otherwise i've not done my job Mm. right like if you are as good a jedi as i am then i failed somewhere along the way and i need to figure out how to correct that with the next one right it's it's why what dave filoni says about duel of the fates who will train anakin Mm. qui-gon or obi-wan right because like if qui-gon had trained anakin it would have been a very different thing because Qui-Gon was already in that place and already had learned that lesson, the most important lesson that, that was going to go into training Anakin Skywalker. Right. Um, But, but Obi-Wan had to learn that lesson by training Anakin. Mm. And then, you know, so when Luke shows up, Obi-Wan is ready to train Luke, but, but yeah, he wasn't ready for Anakin yet. Um, And that's why it's the duel of the fates. Right. I, but all of it, all of it hinges on Qui Gon's choices. You know, uh, using Jar Jar to 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 get to Theed, right? Like all of, like that that he doesn't do that, everything changes. Um, you know, the decision to to stop on Tatooine. Uh, you know, I, I I taking Anakin. All of this. Like Qui Gon, Qui Gon is central to the entire thing. He's so important, but it all plays into Palpatine's plan. But like the one of the thing, there there are a couple of things that Palpatine doesn't account for, right? 
and it depends on what how we're looking at it did palpatine actually create anakin and i don't i i personally don't believe that like i that's not that's not in in my um canon beliefs of star wars it's like you know the I don't know. I lean more towards since the since the Force Awakens and and the sequel trilogy. I lean more towards the idea that the Force manifested Anakin, and then Palpatine took advantage of it. Mm. Um, but I I Qui Gon was one of the pieces that Palpatine wasn't ready for, um, and had Qui Gon lived, Palpatine's plan wouldn't have come to fruition. Like it, like I I think like. If you had had Obi Wan go off on his own thing, um, take on his own Padawan, which which in my in my Infinity's canon, when Qui Gon lives, Obi Wan ends up being Ahsoka's master, right? Like mm. that that ends up being that. Like uh, Ahsoka doesn't go to Anakin because they go along a different path, right? Um, and it's like it just changes everything and so Palpatine's just never able to because if Ahsoka doesn't have the failings of Anakin in her teachings if she's just taught by Obi-Wan I think she ends up becoming the Ahsoka from later on in the saga much faster Mm. (laughs) right she shortcuts it um, uh, through Obi-Wan and if Obi-Wan doesn't have as much of that darkness you know sort of swirling around that anger from his from the death of Qui-Gon and the fight with Maul it becomes a very different story. So like, like it all, it, every, everything in the prequels hinges on Qui-Gon as a character. Mm. Um, I could talk about him obviously like f- f- forever. <laughs> I, I, you, you, you talk about Qui-Gon for a little bit. Cause I, cause yeah, I, I think I've given my perspective on him, but, but why do you put him on this list I and just, put him so high? I just appreciate that. He has always just been so focused on the living force and, and the moment and, Mm-hmm. I think some of his one-liners are so good. Even his tone poem is like amazing. Uh, those little like commercial advertisements they did for *Phantom Menace*, um, mm-hmm. where like each character kind of narrates uh, a little bit of, of like you know their character's path. Um, yeah, do what you think you cannot do has been living in my head for you know rent-free for the last twenty-five years, um, and I just I hear Liam Neeson's voice saying it. Um, I just really appreciate how, you know, every every other Jedi just seems so not stressed, but like concerned with different things. But Qui Gon Jinn is just like, yeah. no, live in the moment, right now. Look in front of you. What is what is going on around you? Like, what's you know, what's the immediate problem? And I appreciate that he kind of has that style, and it's. I I mean, we've talked a little bit about Master and Apprentice. I love the, you know, the juxtaposition of those two characters together, Qui Gon and Obi Wan, because Obi Wan is so like, especially in the beginning, rigid and by the book and mm-hmm. can't think outside the box, right? Like he has to follow every rule, and you know, it's it's everything is protocol, and Qui Gon's just like, no, 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 man, like those are those are guidelines, those are okay for starters. But you need to be looking at, you know, like I said, what's going on in front of you? What's going on in the moment? Don't worry yeah. about the future. Don't worry about what you already did in the past. Like, you got to worry about right now. The The stuff you have control over is right now. It's not tomorrow. It's not yesterday. Um, and I just I always appreciated that that, you know, character has always just been so very, fo- like, your focus determines your reality, right? Like, it's yeah his... that's that's the line i was i was you, I, I was you were sort of like circling around it and i was <laughs> like we got to get that in there because to me like your focus determines your reality is a thing that i say to myself on mm. a daily basis like yeah. like you say like yeah. that like like that is a living rent free like that phrase um it does <laughs> not get as much <laughs> play and as much i i I credit in the fandom and in star wars as it should like do or do not there is no try is is the jedi uh sort of the axiom that everybody goes to and 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 go you know along with may the force be with you your focus determines your reality is quite possibly the most jedi Mm. ethos that was ever espoused in 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 any of the films and i would say like in any of star wars like that that piece right there 
given by Qui-Gon taken, you know, as part of his whole, his whole uh, uh, set of teachings in the Phantom Menace um, to me is like, like that is, that is core to what it means to, to truly be a Jedi. And when he talks about trusting in the living force, that's what he's talking about, Mm. but he's trying to teach it to Anakin who doesn't understand the force yet. So he, 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 he boils it down with with a more general way of saying it and that is like your focus determines your reality but that is to me it's the most important lesson life lesson that i think anybody can take away from star wars yeah. and it comes from qui-gon because what he's saying in that is that like if you dwell <clears throat> on your negative thoughts your reality will be a negative reality mm. But if you focus on, you know, not positivity in the sense of like, like toxic positivity of like everything is great, but of like optimism, right? Mm. Of like, even in the bad moments, we can fix it. We can yeah. deal with it, right? Like if people could do that, our mental health would be better. <laughs> the world would be a better place because mm. we wouldn't be focused on the past. We wouldn't be focused on the, you know, anxieties of the future, um we if your focus determines your reality keep your mind present you know i i ha- be mindful of the future but not at the expense of the moment right did, qui-gon's just so mm, yeah he's it yeah did you, you get continue. to start you have more uh, to say. no well i mean more question for you did you get to yeah. start living force yet I started it, but I okay. but I, I I haven't gone back to it. Like I, okay. I I'm seven chapters in. But oh, yeah. so you, but okay. Qui-Gon... So, you, so you got to basically what I was getting at, where Qui Gon kind of issues the challenge to the Council of, hey, you guys are the Jedi Council and everything, and you're dealing at this super high level of uh you know problem solving and trying to help people, but like you're kind of missing the point of helping people directly. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's just like yeah. Awesome. Well, he, I, I'm at the point where he's got Obi Wan running around doing all of these errands, and everybody's kind of <laughs> okay. like, like, like rolling their eyes at like, oh, Qui Gon's up to his nonsense, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've got. I I think that there was one scene where he does talk to the council okay. to like sort of report. Okay. That there's other stuff going on, mm-hmm. but but um, yeah, yeah. Qui- not, I don't think I'm quite there yet. Qui Gon in general, I mean, not not so much the book, but like the book just reinforced it for me that Qui Gon was just. I mean, you said it already, right? Like he's the guy who already gets it. He's like so ahead of the curve, and like he. It's just nice to see a Jedi that's just compassionate all the time, like the way he is the way he treats people in phantom menace and like nobody else treats people no other jedi treats people the way qui-gon treats them like i remember people making fun of the way he he was with shmi because it was like oh he's macking it just like no he's not he's just he's qui-gon he's just a cool guy he's he's just you know he, he just knows how to treat people with respect and kindness and and compassion i don't know i don't know man qui-gon is just built different and i don't think he gets enough love frankly yeah absolutely no i i think that's the perfect way to put it is that he is he is just built different right like it's so um he gets to do all of the stuff that we want to see a jedi do right like he's Mm -hmm. awesome with his lightsaber he's he's you know mind tricking left right and center (laughs) um i can remember a lot of debate at the time when people were like like i like qui-gon doesn't seem very jedi like because he's like he lies Mm. to people he might as well be stealing because he tried to use the jedi mind trick to get the uh to take these basically these credits that aren't worth anything yeah. so you're yeah. basically stealing um yeah and and I'm, yeah like he cheats with the chance cubes right like mm-hmm. like because he gets to get what he wants uh, to 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 ensure that anakin will be the one that's freed right um but but that's what makes qui-gon such an interesting fascinating character to mm-hmm. me is that like it's morality is not that simple Mm. it is not as cut and dry as like lying is bad stealing is bad it's like well what are we working for here right um wado is a character who will get himself in and out of all sorts of trouble 
So if Qui-Gon takes a hyperdrive from him and gives him Republic credits, Qui-Gon can see and trusting in the living force, right? Mm -hmm. Which is communicating with him at all times. He's looking at it and going like, if I take from this junk dealer today, man, he'll figure out a way he'll turn. He, it, it, but it's his choice, right? Like, like based on his choices, there is a potentiality with this individual that he could take these Republic credits and he could turn it into something incredible, mm -hmm. right? Like he could spin this into a business venture. And so like, am I stealing from this guy? No, I'm not stealing from this guy. I am presenting an opportunity to him, whether he takes it or not, it's up to him. It's up to the force. What I know in this moment right now is that in order for me to get back to Coruscant, in order to save the people of Naboo, which is the thing that I have been charged with, this is what I got to do, right? Mm -hmm. This is the quickest path to that. And that is what I have to, I have to expedite this process. But then through, through that, he is like, like you see him come to the realization of like, you know, Watto's like mind tricks don't work on me. Mm -hmm. And then that turns into like, this kid keeps popping up why are we here? We're on Tatooine for a different reason. Mm -hmm. I thought that I was here because, you know, we need to get back to Coruscant. And then you see him sort of like when he realizes at that table that, at uh, you know, talking to Shmi and, and learning about the pod racing, he's like, mm, okay, we're going to take a beat. We're going to take a beat. We're not leaving Tatooine until I figure out what it is the force wants from me here and why it has brought me to this planet because clearly it has something to do with this boy right and he and so you know he opens himself up to it he he listens and then over the course of that you know you you you, you actually see him like working it out mm. um as he like he messages or not messages like communicating with obi-wan and obi-wan's like why do i get the feeling we've picked up another pathetic life form mm. or whatever he says and then he has a conversation with Shmi where Shmi's like, you are, you're going to take him, aren't you? Like he's a, he's like, there's something special about, about Anakin. And it's like, yeah, look, listen, like I haven't figured it all out yet, but yes, there is something here. Um, uh, this wasn't a mistake, you know, mm -hmm. I, I <clears throat> th like, these are the things about Qui-Gon that, that make him, a character worth studying, even though he is in one movie, he is in mm -hmm. one of these star Wars movies, you know, um, there's still so much there. Every time I go back, every time I watch the Phantom Menace, including my most recent viewing, it's like, there are just, there are more and more things that I notice about him. Um, and then when I, you notice things about him, then you start to think about Obi-Wan and then you start to think about Anakin and you think about the way that things go. And it's just, um, there's so much depth layered into that character into the way that he's written and this is where like like uh, i know that i will not convince everybody how i feel about the prequels especially phantom menace um but but this is why i can confidently say i'm done apologizing for these movies uh, like qui-gon is the character qui-gon is the one <laughs> that i'll say to people like you can debate with me about the execution of it and about what comes across directly in the film and and I and I'll concede a lot of it to you that like yeah I don't think that George nailed it in terms of the way that that he got all of these things across, but I will challenge you to recognize that it is there, it is there and it's like it is purposeful and it's meaningful and George was telling a story that required dramaturgy in order to get to the bottom of it and for people who don't understand what dramaturgy is like dramaturgy is the practice of looking at a story of looking at at, at drama you know it's something that usually if you're studying theater or acting um that you that you you learn dramaturge but it's it is it is the study of of like dissecting stories it's what we do here on podcasts and stuff when we talk about star wars ad nauseum right and the prequels require it the prequels require it in the same way that shakespeare does and to go back to what i said about the prequels on on our last couple episodes like one of the reasons why people just cannot get the prequels is that they want to look at them like buck rogers and flash gordon like the original trilogy but that's not what they are they mm. are 
Shakespeare. They are classical literature. You have to look at them with a lens that with the same lens that you would look at Shakespeare or Chaucer or, um, you know, if you were going to look at Paradise Lost, right? Like, like epic poems, even going back to like Greek mythology, you to look at Homer and look at the Odyssey and, and stuff like that, right? Like the same lens that we would use to view those, we have to view the prequels. And when you do, they open wide, like they, they turn into this other thing. And Qui-Gon exemplifies that for me because he is this character that has so little screen time. That was what I said last week, right? He is the lead character of this first film. He is the protagonist of The Phantom Menace. And to look at it any other way is a mistake. And it's the reason why people don't gel with the movie. But once you step back, you look at it and you go, Qui-Gon is the lead character of The Phantom Menace. All of a sudden, The Phantom Menace comes together as a film. Mm. Like all of a sudden it makes sense. And the reason, you know, the, 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 the pacing of it makes sense. And all of it makes sense. You look at it, it's Shakespeare. And Qui-Gon is our protagonist. He's our, he is our hero in the same way that Shakespeare would present you with a hero in your story. You look at it from that lens and all of a sudden it just like, it all comes into, to like pristine clear view for me, at least that's been my experience with it. But, uh, you know, as Obi-Wan would say, many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own <laughs> point of view. And, I am a huge Shakespeare nerd. Uh, so, so it's like, that's the lens that I'm able to use in order to, to understand these films. But um, yeah, I think that brings us to our number one. This is a little bit of a longer episode than I think we anticipated, but that's okay. We got good stuff. Um, that brings us to our number one, obviously, obviously who else would it be? It's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, it's Obi-Wan. I was pretty sure we were going to say Massa Meta, but Oh, sorry. I, I, yeah, I figured when we notes. both said, we know who number one's going to be. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. All right, whatever. It is funny because yeah, before we were, it's like, like we didn't even, you know, need to say it out loud. But <laughs> um, yeah, Obi-Wan Kenobi. So here's my argument for this. Okay. For Obi-Wan being number one. Everything that I just said about Qui-Gon being the protagonist of The Phantom Menace, that is me accepting the reality of what we are presented with and what we were given. Um, the reason why I put Obi-Wan, I mean, Obi-Wan is just, he's my favorite Star Wars character, full stop. But the reason why I put him as the, as, as the number one prequel character is because if you took a second and you reframed the entire saga not the entire saga, the entire trilogy, prequel trilogy as Obi-Wan's story, instead of it starting as Qui-Gon's story and then transferring to Anakin and then sort of being split between Anakin and Obi-Wan for the next two films. If it was just centrally focused on Obi-Wan and he was the lead character of all three films and we stuck with his perspective in the way that we stick with Luke's perspective in the original trilogy, the way that we stick with Rey's perspective in the sequels, then those films would have been infinitely more successful and they would have gotten their point across way better. But in order to do it, you have to do a bunch of things all of a sudden, you know, in order, and this is all hindsight. This is all the benefit of me being able to look at all three films that are already out, compare them to the other star Wars movies that are all out in the year 2024. So I don't fault George for any of this. This is me you know, with a time machine going back and changing things. If you combined the characters of Darth Maul and Count Dooku into one character and you don't introduce Sidious until Revenge of the Sith, you fix the prequels for 99% (laughs) of the audience. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Right. So if, if Palpatine is not in, I mean, Palpatine is in, the phantom menace and we all who know star wars know that that's obviously the guy who becomes the emperor but we never see sidious right we never see that alter ego in the first two films we're sitting there in those first two films going like what's how is is and and this is the thing dooku doesn't exist like dooku was dooku but is maul in this reality that i've created so we're going like is maul going to turn palpatine at some point 
right? Like you're asking that question through the first two movies mm. until you get to the third movie and you find out that actually Palpatine has been Sidious this whole time and that Maul has been reporting to him. Mm. But we didn't know that because we never saw it, right? So then you have you have Maul showing up in in Phantom Menace. Like let's say we're on Tatooine, right? And as we get back to the ship, um, because we've switched the focus and, and Obi-Wan is the lead character, Obi-Wan was the one who went into to, uh, uh, Mos Espa and found Anakin and, and Qui-Gon stayed back to protect the, 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 the queen, presumably, even though the queen was with, you know, the, them the whole time in Mos Espa, but whatever. Um, and this dude shows up and attacks Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon sees this and then Obi-Wan gets you know anakin go and just barely makes it out and uh and then you know they're on the ship and and you know it's like oh this is anakin skywalker you know this virgins in the force whatever blah blah blah. they have that conversation and then they walk away and qui-gon goes that was my former master (laughs) (laughs) right like and we get that reveal of like 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 halfway through the phantom menace and and obi-wan's like what are you like what are you talking about it's like that was that was dooku right i i he left the order right and blah blah blah. they have a conversation about that and then we get back and it's like like and then the conversation with the jedi council is like dooku is a sith and the council is like that's impossible more than more than the like you know kiati mundi you know being like being like the sith have been extinct extinct for a millennia it's like then the conversation is like this is impossible there's no way that one of ours could become a sith Right, like the a, a Dooku, especially no way, right? So you've got that narrative going through it, and then and then they fight him at the end, and it's like, but he's revealed like I'm no longer Dooku now, I'm Darth Maul, and he kills Qui Gon, and then escapes, right? In the way that he escapes in Attack of the Clones, right? He gets away, and now now you've got Obi Wan has so much motivation for the next two movies. And most importantly, it's motivation that is distracting him from the task that he really should be looking at, which is training Anakin, mm. right? Um, and and he's on a path of revenge. And so instead of being the Jedi that he's supposed to be, Obi-Wan is is obsessed with, with you know, vengeance for Qui-Gon and stopping this war from happening by defeating Darth Maul. Um, and Anakin is watching all of this happen. And that's why Anakin, that this is one of the things that leads Anakin down the path to the dark side. Right. So that's my whole, like, you know, uh, if I, if, if I could go back and change everything and, and redo it and, and do the prequels myself, that's what they would have been. But, um, and, and most of the other stuff is intact. The, the, the clones are Django Fett and, and, you know, like, like all of this, like everything else falls into place along the lines of this. But if you just change that one piece, I think that all of a sudden now, um, I, everything kind of like it, it becomes the, the, the trilogy becomes so much more cohesive to me as with Obi-Wan as the central character, mm. which is very easy for me to say, cause he's my favorite. So it's like, <laughs> why not make him the lead character? But it's just, it, it, when he's the central character, we don't have to have that handoff between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan for Anakin. Um, Anakin comes into the story in this role and stays in that role throughout until he becomes Darth Vader as this like supporting character to Obi-Wan's story. Um, and and from a narrative perspective, it's like when we put Anakin in the background as a supporting character, I mean, he's obviously still a lead in the way that Han and Leia are also leads in in the original trilogy. Right. But when you when you decentralize him and 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 don't make him the, the Luke Skywalker of Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, then the audience is sitting there going like, like we need to pay more attention to Anakin guys. We need to be paying more attention to Anakin, which is the narrative for Obi-Wan, which is that like, he needs to be paying more attention to Anakin. If he was paying more attention to Anakin, he doesn't become Darth Vader. Right. But so we, as the audience are then put in the perspective of Obi-Wan, um, but frustratingly. So mm. I, but that's what makes the payoff when he turns that much better. Right. So, um, that is my justification for Obi Wan being number one because I, I, your justification I, I, for Obi Wan is what you would do differently. Well, <laughs> yeah, 
Because because I don't need to in this episode where we are talking about our favorite prequel characters, I don't think that I need to talk to people about why I love <laughs> Obi Wan and why I think he's the best. I think I have talked about that ad nauseum. So that's like that's me taking the assignment and using it to talk about <laughs> Obi Wan in a new way. But like like I like that that there's a there's an injustice in the Phantom Menace and that Obi Wan is not served in that story to me. Um, he gets some great moments and, and there is, you know, the foundations of his character development, but it's not until we get to attack of the clones that he, you know, steps into the lead role and, and um, sharing it with Anakin, right? Like, mm-hmm. like the, the, those two characters are switching off back and forth in that lead role. Um, but he goes off on his detective story, his, his film noir detective storyline. And, that's when I fell in love with the character, right? Mm-hmm. Like I was not in love with the character as portrayed by Alec Guinness. I always liked Obi-Wan, but he wasn't my favorite. And then Phantom Menace, he's there and I like him, but he's not my favorite character in that movie by, by a long stretch, right? Like, like Qui-Gon is absolutely my favorite from that film. But then when we get to Attack of the Clones, all of a sudden, like I am obsessed I am obsessed to the extent that like I grow my hair out <laughs> to look like you and McGregor in, in attack of the clones. Right. Like you, you, like, you are now the, I don't know if you knew this about Carl Leclerc. I'm, I, I don't know if I'm allowed, I'm going to tell this story anyway. I don't know if I'm supposed to, but I'm gonna, uh, are you aware that when attack of the clones came out that, uh, Carl permed his hair to look like Hayden Christensen? I did not know that, but now it you makes do. so much sense. And now everybody knows yeah. it. So, sorry, Carl, but it was relevant because now you are the second friend that I know that changed their hairstyle yeah. specifically because of a Star Wars <laughs> character. I had been growing it out to look like Tom Cruise in Vanilla Sky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I really, really loved Vanilla Sky and, and Mission Impossible too, right? Because he that was sort of his like long hair era. Okay. But Tom Cruise has like very straight hair, right? And I don't, I, my hair is, is very wavy. And so I had started growing it out and it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. I was not looking like Tom Cruise in Vanilla Sky. Um, but then here comes, here comes Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I'm like, my hair can look like that though. <laughs> and so throughout the first half of, of, uh, grade 12, that's what I looked like. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I mean, my hair is darker, but yeah. And then, and then I started trying to grow my beard. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I think we all try in, in at that age. I'm to, still to trying to grow beard, my but, beard and it's just not yeah. working. That's okay. I, I, you, maybe you'll get there one day. Um, <laughs> Thanks dad. No, I mean like, like the reason why I have a beard today is, is t- it's twofold. There are two characters. It is not, it is not just Obi-Wan. It starts much earlier than that. It's also Riker from next generation. Okay. I mean, like I, like, like when Riker shows up in season two and he's got the beard, I, I, and all of a sudden he, you know, now we take that character seriously. Cause in season one with no beard, uh, Riker is not, you were here nobody for it. Cares. Okay. Nobody's listening. Um, yeah, no, but, uh, so yeah, I grew up, I grew up admiring, uh, Jonathan Frakes magnificent beard. Um, uh, that that is so iconic that when they design Xanatos for gargoyles, they're like, "Well, he's got to have at least a goatee, guys." Like, we, if we've got Jonathan Frakes. It's we gotta we we gotta translate that gloriousness to two D. Was Xanatos um, Qui Gon's first apprentice? Also, from those like I can't remember what they oh, were called Jedi Apprentice books. I think I don't remember. It's something. It is something like that. Yeah. So the name Xanatos, I think, is Greek myth, right? Okay. So um, uh, it's no one idea. of those things where it's like somebody probably like took that and like the you know did the Star Wars thing yeah. to it, where you just like kind of yeah. tweak it a little bit. But um, that's for, that is familiar to me. But I never read those books. So, oh, okay. Um, uh, but yeah, you're talking like the the you're talking about the Jedi Apprentice ones. Yeah, the, I think the, Jedi Apprentice, the yeah. Obi Wan ones, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like the 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 teen, like young yes. reader, yes, 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 books. Yeah, um, but yeah, I I but Obi Wan, I mean, like, yeah, him with the the beard showing up in Attack of the Clones, he's got the hockey hair and the beard, and uh, I just was instantly in love with the character, <laughs> um, and started like living my life 
modeled after him. And I remember when the Revenge of the Sith trailer came out, that first trailer, um, we get the 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 shot of you know when they crash the the interceptors on the uh, uh, on Grievous's ship, right? Yeah, and like like to land them, mm-hmm. and Obi Wan skids, and the cockpit opens, and he jumps out, ignites his lightsaber, mm-hmm. lands, and mm-hmm. takes out two battle droids. Mm-hmm. I like that moment. I was like, he's the coolest character in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> like like nobody has done, nobody's ever done anything nearly that cool in all of Star Wars. And up until that point, up until it, not quite that point, it was a little bit later, but that was sort of when it really started to gel for me that like, Oh, I really love Obi-Wan. Um, I would have told you that Han Solo was my favorite character in star Wars. Ah, okay. And then I, man, which, which statue was it? I think it was when I got, I think it was when I got the, the first statue that sideshow did of Obi-Wan in the clone trooper armor. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, like the, the, what, the micro series, but realistic. Yeah, yeah, uh, and awesome. yeah. It's it's Ewan's face, but he's in the armor, and he's he's got like the one foot on the yeah. the battle droid. I I've right? got the mini bust version of that because I think they came out around the same time. Um. So I also have the mini bust. Okay. I I because because they released that statue and like the the pictures of it, he looked majestic and phenomenal. And then <laughs> the one that was released, this is sideshow to a T, right? Gentle giant sideshow. Um. I, the face sculpt did not come out in (laughs) reproduction as great as it did in the original sculpt. Mm. So as a, as an apology, they were like, if you bought that statue, you get a discount on the, the mini bus. Um, so I got the mini bus. So I have the mini bus that statue. I don't have on display right now. Cause I don't have room for it at the moment because I have the mythos statue. Oh my God. Mythos statue out. But I do have the mini bus next to it. Like he's, he's right next to it. That, um, that mythos statue is my white whale. That mythos statue is like, like there are, there are three key pieces to my collection and they're the three characters that are the most important to me. They are like the ones that, that like my adult persona is modeled after. <laughs> so I've got the mythos Obi-Wan. I, the, the, um, premium, I think it's premium format Superman. I, 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 that sideshow did and he's like he's a little bit bigger mm. than mythos obi-wan and then i've got my hot toys iron man <laughs> i down there down there with them it's like you 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 put those three characters together and you get a pretty good approximation of who i am <laughs> um i but yeah i but it was it was i think it was when i got that clone wars statue and i like that and then the and then the mini bust you know what it was and then i got the kotobukiya obi-wan like like uh, a new hope obi-wan um where he looked his robes are like flowing and he looks so badass and Mm. it's like it's out it's that was the one where it's like i bought that and it's like alec guinness (laughs) obi-wan but looking as badass as prequel obi-wan and it's like and i had there they were like on the top of my uh uh, display at the time just one of those ikea um i can't remember the name of the the display but it's the one that we've all had as collectors the detail it's uh yeah like the it's the the one that's like glass on four sides with the wood on the top and the bottom right okay yeah the f- three shelves right um it's like the it, like this display case was made for collectors basically <laughs> to to put our toys in yeah um i had i had these three statues sort of on the top of it and i, I have a facebook post and it comes up in my memories every once in a while uh, not every once in a while every year right facebook reminds me of when i made this post which is like and the post is literally, I don't think I can continue to say that Han Solo is my favorite Star Wars character. <laughs> Cause at that point, like I had no Han Solo statues. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still have no Han Solo statues. Han Solo is not even in my top five anymore. Like that's like, that's, that's the funny thing is that for years I would have told you that he was my favorite Star Wars character um, for most of the, my fandom up until that point. And then it's like at that point everything changed. I was like, nope, it's Obi Wan Kenobi, number one, numero uno. Like this is my guy, um, and it, and I have not looked back since then. And and you know, Kanan gives him a run for his money. So on any given day, depending on what I'm focused on, again, as Qui Gon would say, your focus determines your reality. If I'm talking about Kanan, he's my favorite in that moment. But if I'm talking about Obi Wan, he's my favorite. So, but Obi Wan it. 
it often just comes back to Obi Wan, <laughs> and I live my life by the by the 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 ideology of what would Obi Wan Kenobi do, and uh, you know, you can do. It whatever. usually gets me into more trouble than than it helps, yeah. but uh, but I'm gonna keep doing it. So, yeah, Space Jesus is my favorite Star Wars character. Uh, He's a cool guy, and he doesn't afraid of anything. He doesn't. How how do you feel about Obi Wan Kenobi? <laughs> Dude, I don't have anything to add to that. He's the best. <laughs> He's awesome. Like, what's He's not to love about him? He's charismatic. He cares about doing the right thing. He tries to be good to his friends. He tries. I mean, you know, he falls a little bit short in terms of. Uh, what Anakin needs, but it's because he's trying to be gentle and kind with him. Um, he's just the man. Like he's he's the ideal Jedi. Even though he, I mean, maybe not the ideal Jedi, but like he's he's the guy. He's the textbook definition of a Jedi. Before they realized, okay, we need the Jedi to be a little bit better than this, but like this is the guy. Like this is our this is our guy. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I just I, I I know we're talking prequels only, but like everything they did with him in Clone Wars, everything they did with all like the other media, like he's just awesome. Ewan McGregor is like is like I don't know, man. I don't I don't know why I'm on a podcast with you talking about. I can't articulate anything. <laughs> Obi Wan's off. I'm not. <laughs> I am not going to out Obi Wan you. Um, He's just the guy. Obi-Wan's the guy. That's it, man. The guy. TM. Yeah, he is. He is. I think when it comes to the prequels, like Obi-Wan is the prequels, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's, and that's what we're talking about. These are they're our favorite prequel characters and Obi-Wan is the prequels. Uh, yeah. And then, and then the Obi-Wan Kenobi series just goes and just like <clears throat> explodes that and gives you everything about that character that you wanted and everything that you didn't know you needed with him and him and Leia and all of that. And, and you and just getting to come back to that role and play that character again. It's just, yeah, I could, I could, if, if you said like, you can only have one character, like we had to erase every <laughs> other character from the planet. Oh man. It's like, Obi Wan and like you, you you get to keep one. Obi Wan Kenobi would be that character. He's for your me. guy. Yeah, I don't yeah. blame you. He he's the man. He's not just my favorite Star Wars character. This is what this is why Kanan I think will never take it over because like I love Kanan so much, but Obi Wan is like my favorite character in pop culture. He's my favorite character in media in mm. in storytelling and the long history of human. Yeah, yeah, society, you know, I, I culture like Obi Wan is like he's my favorite. He's your guy. He's the guy. <laughs> yeah. That's it. He's the guy. Yep. Cool. Well, I think that does it then, doesn't it? That, I, that, I feel it does. That that puts the lid on our favorite pre- prequel <laughs> characters. I I awesome. I yeah, we ended up almost with a two hour episode <laughs> <Whoops>. <laughs> out of this one. Sorry, we should have known better. We should have kept it to three characters, but we couldn't. We had to talk about these others. Uh, awesome. Well, I hope that everybody enjoyed that. You guys can, you know, hit us up on social media and let us know who we didn't talk about that you think we should have. Remember, these are characters that are featured in the films, uh, which I know that there are several characters that show up and, you know, they're in the background or they get a name drop like Master Boss. But <laughs> I, I, We'll, we will return to this conversation, this prequel era, when we talk about our favorite Clone Wars characters in the future, for sure. Um, but uh, but yeah, let us know. Let us know. Hit us up uh, at Force POV on all of the social medias and uh, and let us know who you think are the best prequel characters. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Tell and Mike why he's back. wrong and why it's not Obi-Wan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try. Try me. <laughs> Come at me, bro. Uh, uh, Awesome. Thank you guys for listening, and we will catch you on the next episode. Follow Force Perspectives on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ForcePOV. And join us on Discord at thunderquack.com slash Discord. Support the show by visiting us at patreon.com slash thunderquack to get early access to episodes. Leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast service, or buy merch at store.thunderquack.com. 
Force Perspectives is a part of the Thunderquack Podcast Network.